Tinder topped TikTok, YouTube, Disney Plus in time spent in 2020. So much about last year was unexpected, unprecedented. What surprised you most about what you saw in user behavior? All right, great to be here, Emily. Good to see you. Um, well, look, I mean, the first thing is I think when COVID first hit, and again, I joined the company end of July, beginning of August of last year. Uh, but when COVID first hit, a lot of people were wondering what was even going to happen to dating apps? You know, are they going to go out of business? You know, what's happening? Very quickly, online dating, which is already the trend, became the main way for people to be able to connect and meet new people. So it, but by the time March had ended, you already had the first day over 3 billion swipes on Tinder. And by the end of the year, as you said, it happened over 130 times. As you went through the year, it migrated from at first being a way to connect with people online only. Then it became a way to connect and maybe do some activities together. So people were doing things like playing Animal Crossing together online after meeting on Tinder. And then by the end of COVID, it became a way you know, to start venturing back out again, which is obviously what we're about to see now. So I know there have been more video calls, more time taken to get to know you, which makes sense. What happens then to dating in 2021? What does this look like in a post-pandemic new normal? Well, again, the, back to some of the trends, I think, that started. And again, I would, I would almost compare this to a category like streaming, where that was already the trend. And, you know, the COVID period of time put that over the top uh, for the way people were consuming video and TV. Same thing here. Online dating was already the trend. Uh, but now that stigma is almost completely gone in the way that people are, it's the main way that they meet. So the first thing we saw was conversations were up 20%. The length of those conversations was up 30%. And uh, by the end, you know, all through the year, the total number of matches between people up over 40%. Uh, so in this, again, was, was something where even heading into the COVID year, uh, you know, 40% uh, of all couples were meeting online and Tinder driving over 25% of those means 10% of all people were meeting on, couples were meeting on Tinder. That is uh, not only the trend in the US, but it's going to be the trend around the globe. But what post-pandemic growth are you expecting? I mean, will Tinder still be topping the charts when we're not in lockdown? Yeah, there's some there's some debate about is this are we heading into the summer of love? And I, I think uh, you know we've seen an 8x increase in the mention of vaccines in our profiles, so we definitely you know are seeing people headed towards that. You know, look, people are still having a hard time in Europe and places like Brazil. The the uh, the pandemic is still raging there, and in the U.S., we think. Most people will be vaccinated by the end of May. So that, uh, you know, we think that that is, uh, is certainly something that we'll be building into. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think, again, this trend towards online dating was something already very significant. It's, it's been accelerating. Every online dating company, you know, we're part of Match Group and own several in the category, are seeing that growth. I think the only question is, you know, what is life on the other side of COVID like? But either way, this is now the main way that people uh, you know, are comfortable connecting. And it makes sense because it's just so efficient uh, when you look at the product, the algorithms, um, you know, bringing people together versus just taking your chances out there. So are you saying it will be the summer of love? Will there be a roaring 20s kind of comeback? No, no, it is, it is something where we're, you know, look, I think the baseline is that online dating has done well during this time. Who knows, like, whether it would have been greater without the pandemic, since, again, we were already uh, pretty strong with the trend in this space. Uh, but, you know, every bit that the world opens back up, you know, this is going to be the main way that they connect. You're also relaunching Tinder Passport, which means you can virtually travel anywhere in the world, swipe left and right there. How does that work? Yeah. <laughs> so normally Passport is, a, so that is a product where let's say you can drop your pin in New York City if you're going to be traveling there and start to meet people there in advance of your trip. That is usually behind a paywall. Last April, Tinder launched it for free for the month of April. In that case, as a way to, you know, ease people's loneliness in a time when everybody was quarantined. And we saw a 25% increase in people using it. We had a day uh, where we had 55 million, uh, sorry, yeah, 55 uh, billion match matches, sorry, million matches in that one day. First time that had ever happened. Um, and that was just from the initial launch of Passport. This time, we are doing it for a different reason, which is anticipate. So it'll be free for the month of April, but it'll be starting tomorrow. So you get a, a bonus day. And that would be, you know, with an eye toward the world opening back up. And we've seen the spike in online okay. travel. 
people starting to book that. So we're getting ahead of that one. Now, Bumble recently went public. I've spoken to Whitney Wolfhard a number of times. She talks about the rise in, in older people using the platforms, looking for longer term love, how it's a platform that's safer for women. It is not just Bumble. There's a lot of competition out there. How does, how does Tinder stand out from the pack and stand out from some of the stereotypes that it's for a, a, a younger user who's not necessarily looking for long-term love? Right. Well, I'd say the stereotype in that case, in, in terms of Tinder is true. You know, the majority of our audience is under 30. We're very heavily Gen Z. And there are other products like, like Hinge within the Match Portfolio or Bumble, Bumble, which are for, let's say, older users who are looking for uh, expressly for a more committed relationship. I think the one thing that's great about Tinder and why we're so large and we're the number one consumer uh, you know, app by revenue globally, we're number one in over 100 countries, is because we're non-judgmental that way. It's for everything. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is, you know, we may be driving 10% of all marriages in the United States. At the same time, we're for every kind of relationship. The vast majority are not looking for something that serious at one time, um, but we enable all of it. And, you know, I think one of the great things about Match Group is there are different brands for different ages of the population, different times in your you know, dating journey or where you are at your stage in life and what you're looking for. Um, but Tinder is the biggest and the broadest because not only are, are, are we, you know, we invented a big part of the category, um, you know, but we, uh, you know, let you do, you know, use Tinder for whatever it is you're looking for in a very fluid, non-judgmental way. Right. Now, you also ran CBS Interactive for years, founded CBS All Access, CBSN, which became mm -hmm. Paramount Plus. Got to ask you about the streaming wars between Netflix and Disney Plus and Paramount Plus and HBO. Do you see consolidation mm -hmm. here? Or are we just going to keep paying for more and more streaming services? I've heard some talk about consolidation. I mean, let's say this. I don't know that there's a lot of new entrants coming to the category. And a lot of them, like, again, CBS All Access, which is now Paramount Plus, is still top five in terms of total uh, subscribers and uh, since it launched. Uh, what the one thing you're not going to have is, is that moment in time where Netflix came online from DVDs or free networks decided to give their content to Hulu for, you know, largely for free, or Disney with a 100-year-old catalog spending $100 billion on more content, uh, or Amazon, you know, deciding to give... Uh, Amazon Prime Video away as part of their overall Prime bundle. I mean, these, these are things that are not going to, you know, probably happen again. So you do, I think, have a playing field that's fairly well established now. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm someone who's honestly believed this entire time, and we started the first business plan for all access in, at the end of 2011, uh, that people are going to subscribe to more than one of these things. And they don't tend to churn through in a classic way. They tend to hit pause, and they'll come back when there's more content. Uh, that they want to watch. And so I do think the content wars of putting more and more behind these products is, is going to keep happening. And there's room for, for more of these than I really do think people think. I think the need for consolidation is not quite as urgent uh, among those the four-day players that people will be kind of choosing between.